Hey guys, it's Brie. Uh, today I am working on a crochet project. This is the Snapdragon dress and it is a wrap dress, which I'm super excited about. I got this yarn at the Goodwill and I found like a whole bunch of it. It is a linen and cotton blend and that's super cool. Um, and I wanted to talk more specifically, um, not actually about what I'm crocheting, but about what I've been reading, which is a bunch of books about feminist utopias where there are only women <laughs> or where men stumble across uh, women's utopias because this was a really interesting thing that's been keeping me thinking the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks, I guess, actually. Um, so I had already read a lot of feminist literature from science fiction and fantasy from like 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and it's always fascinated me that there's this idea that was so popular for a while of a land with only women, because it is so clearly one of the things that I think science fiction and fantasy facilitates really well, which is a conversation about the human condition, right? What is it to be a woman? What is it to be a woman in the absence of men? What is it to be a woman when men arrive? And how does the dynamic change? All of that good stuff. Um, I finished her Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who you might know from the Yellow Wallpaper. And then I have a variety of others that have been on my list that I'm slowly working my way through. And it's so fascinating to me the way this conversation has evolved over time and the ways that the feminists of this era seem to have agreed and disagreed with one another and with patriarchy. Um, namely, uh, for Charlotte's, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, the world in which she constructs has this like small society of women that have developed basically in the middle of like South America in the forest somewhere. And like men have whispered and had rumors about this existing, but like it's super dangerous. You can't go find them. Oh no, they're a myth. Like all of this kind of, you know, all of the conversation around that. These three guys from America show up and they're like, fuck it, we're gonna find the women, right? Which is peak American dude. Um, <laughs> they mount this adventure and they go into the woods and of course they do find the society of all women. And the way that Charlotte Perkins Gilman sets this story up is intriguing not just because of the way that the story conceit works right um the women have like the, the long story short is that the women are like castaways from like a very long-standing prior shipwreck where then there were only women and then suddenly like the women magically partook in parthenogenesis essentially which is like a cloning of yourself but with caveats so that it's not like I don't know to, to get out of the the genetic trap of we're all clones um, it's it's very it, techno babble hand wavy is maybe how I would describe it and it's really interesting to me to compare this story to something like a gate to a women's country by uh, Sherry S. Tupper because this story in particular, that is her land, is so distinctly a thought experiment first and a story second. The entire framing device and the, the concept of the story is written in these like adventure exploration journals, essentially. Right, it's this guy looking back at this time and it's very much got the tone of um, an ethnography. So if you've ever read ethnography or if you've like read some kind of fictions that are in the vein of that, an ethnography is where you go into another culture and you're kind of reporting back on that culture. Um, the, the contrast is autoethnography where you are writing about your own culture. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic in and of itself there, just like historically. But this guy is going in and he's describing this culture and so we have this dynamic where, one, Charlotte Perkins Gilman is 
writing from the perspective of a man coming from patriarchy into this society of women and then trying to walk through essentially explaining what she believes the condition of femininity is, the condition of womanhood is, independent of men through the lens of this man. Like it's it's very like onions have layers kind of thing. And I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, like I said, it is first and foremost, I think, it is first and foremost a thought experiment, which in some ways I think it, it is hard for me to classify this in my brain as science fiction, not because it isn't science fiction, uh, but because it's clearly like science fiction is the vessel for a thought experiment as opposed to science fiction happening to have a thought experiment in it, if that makes sense. And her position on what it is naturally to be a woman is really interesting, especially given the limitations that she puts on this society, right? They have very limited resources. They're entirely circular or like contained, I guess is maybe a better word. Um, and so they have like limits on reproduction and all of these different things. And what Gilman or Perkins Gilman, I don't know which one is the right way to refer to her. I'm just gonna call her Gilman. What she really posits is that like, the core aspect of womanhood is a combination of mothering and community. And that when women, when set apart from men, that they will focus on the good of the whole as part of a group. And it's really fascinating to me because this comes down to so much as like they raise each other's children, not in like hostility or in like a brainwashing way, but in like a stepping in the entire community is responsible for the well-being of these children. Um, the women are then of course free to like go after the child is of a certain age and no longer breastfeeding. The, the woman is then to, free to go and go about her job and she has jobs and pursuits of her own. And even if that woman is not able to breed, right, she is not selected to be breeding because that is a very specific thing that they do in this culture where she's made it so that there's a, a limitation on who can and cannot. They still feel themselves as mothers as a result. And it's interesting to me because there's this dynamic that she posits that motherhood or caregiving is in many ways essential to womanhood. And it's, I'm like sitting here chewing on this, right? And I'm holding it up to something like, to something like The Stars Are Legion by Cameron Hurley, where the conceit of the book is, yes, everyone's a woman, but the story is so much about bodily autonomy and speaking to that experience. And I'm trying to parse out for myself where this story stops being an example of the feminism of its time and starts just having like, sorry, hold on. And starts having more to say about collectivism where it starts having more to say about identity and how we define our existence in society right there there's stories with the same conceit right the same underlying premise of there are simply just no men but with such a different way of having that conversation and then to hold that in contrast yet again to Sherry S. Tepper's The Gate to Women Country, which I really love. If you have time, you should read it. That society, like the, that society technically has men, but exiles the men to like this like outside camp kind of thing. And the thing that Tepper explores is whether violence is introduced by men. And some of that is present in Gilman's Herland, because she is talking about, you know, these men come in and they're like raging. They're like, oh my God, these women, what's going on? And one 
of the male characters in particular takes really serious offense, like a very clearly toxic masculinity approach to a land of women, um, and does some of what they call claim to be the most horrific violence that they'd ever seen. Um, it is it is really fascinating to me that you can use the same premise to discuss the existence in such different ways. I've been sitting here thinking about it because there are a variety of other books with the same underlying premise, right? Women's Utopia, right? Uh, I'm thinking uh, specifically about, oh, what's the underwater one? It's not grass. Adorant Ocean, that's what I'm thinking of. And how that novel is also kind of preoccupied with the concept of violence, but also of money, right? And it's just, it's really interesting to me to think about these different ways that it, this basic underlying premise was used to explore different facets of society and different aspects of femininity. It is really fascinating to me that someone would see motherhood as an inherent part of womanhood and not take a moment to interrogate, interrogate whether that is something that you are including because you grow in, like you've grown up in a society where motherhood is the default. Um, and that is of course a, a 2024 retroactive reading of, of the situation. I wish more people were talking about these stories or not necessarily talking about these stories, but writing stories in response to these stories. That's what I really want. Um, I will say, Herland is so very clearly a thought experiment first. You get to a part in the story where uh, Gilman talks specifically about like the nature of womanhood and it, it <laughs> I don't want to say this. I don't want you to take this disparagingly. I'm, I'm not saying it in a like a mean way, but it has all of the vibes of the like 30 page diatribe that Rand goes off on in the middle of Atlas Shrug, where it's it, it like it stops being a story and for a while is just a lecture. <laughs> and not to say that the book is remotely like Rand, like Rand's work or like randian objectivist in any way it's it's not it's talking about completely different things it's just that like pause the story let me explain to you my philosophy moment is very similar <laughs> um i have a couple of other books on my list that are hopefully kind of in the same vein of this ideally with a little bit more story involved um but yeah that's just I am interested in your thoughts if you've read, uh, well, really any of those. If you've read Herland, if you've read A, A Door into Ocean, if you've read um, Gate to Women's Country, is, is there a value in these thought experiments? Because to me, it's it's not even so interesting to to have the story sometimes as it is not the conclusions even that the thought experiment leads to. Like the real interesting part is seeing the underlying thought process of the author in constructing these worlds and what they think or what they're going to posit that womanhood is independent of men. And it's just really, it feels so much to me that you can identify the time periods and like the philosophies that these writers are coming from so distinctly, right? And especially as you get out of that first kind of big, is it the 70s and 80s push of these kind of stories? And you're looking at something more modern. Um, Book of the Unnamed Midwife might be actually another really good one about this, although it's speaking to different issues. I just, I have a lot of thoughts and they haven't stopped going around in my head. I, I don't know that I have anything more articulate to say than this. Um, but yeah, let me, let me know what you think about these stories. Is there, what do you find most interesting about them? What do you find most valuable if you find anything valuable about them? Um, 
yeah, I again, I, I don't have much more articulate to say. I, I haven't done this in a while, so I'm doing a clumsy goodbye, but um, I'll see you guys soon. And you know the drill, do all the other things. Um, hopefully I'll be, I'll have more progress on this dress. Look, it's almost got a bodice. We'll see, we'll see where we are next time. Um, it looks a lot better than it did when it was just a couple rows of this stitch pattern. I was like, crochet is such a trust the process kind of project. Anyway, talk to you later. Bye.